how God must have felt. Now, we can only know something about God by what he has revealed to us about himself. And God reveals himself to us in terms that we can understand. For example, the Bible speaks of God's hands, God's arms, his eyes, even his back. But he doesn't have those physically. But it, he speaks of those so that you and I can relate to him. And he also reveals to us his feelings. Feelings that you and I can identify with. And I'm taking actually a huge risk this morning to try and convey what it, he must have felt like. Because he is not like us. He is sovereign. He's almighty. He's all-knowing. And yet he reveals to us some of his deepest feelings. So let's start at the beginning. And according to Julie Andrews in The Sound of Music, that's a very good place to start. The purpose of creation. God is a triune God. Three persons in one. And note this, if he wasn't, he could not be the eternal God of love. Because love requires someone else to love. And God lived in this perfect harmony of love. Three persons in one. Totally fulfilled within himself. And it's very hard. I do not understand the Trinity. Please don't ask me to explain it to you. We just know that the scripture teaches that. But despite the fact that he was totally fulfilled within himself, for reasons that I will never understand, he had an intense longing to share that love relationship with mankind. For example, Jesus said to his disciples in John 59, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Now I can understand God as the one who gives us love. And we do focus mainly on that truth. But it is it absolutely blows my mind that he should actually want my love, your love. And that's why Proverbs 8.31 tells us that the Lord especially delighted in mankind. And by the way, the fact that it says that he delighted in mankind just reveals again that he is a God of emotions. And he had an intense longing to share that love relationship with mankind. That's why the greatest commandment is to love him. Please note, it is not to serve him or to obey him. The greatest command is to love him with all our hearts, all our souls, all our minds. You know that scripture very well. And please note, God does not need our love. But he knows it's only in a love relationship with him that we can find our greatest happiness and our greatest fulfillment. But he took a great risk in creating mankind. He gave them the moral capacity to rebel against their creator. Genesis 2.17, he said to Adam and Eve, But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. And somebody asked me just the other day, Why did God allow that? I mean, why did he give mankind that choice? To rebel against him. Because if you think about it, the sculpture could now spit at the sculptor. And no creative artist had ever done that. Why did God give us the choice? I'll tell you why. He gave them the moral capacity to rebel against the creator because love must always be based on free will. Otherwise, it is not love. He could have just created us as puppets to love him without having any choice about it. And I don't want to be married to somebody who is forced to love me. Nor do you. And as one would do for a loved one, God gave Adam and Eve everything to enjoy. They were to rule over all creatures. They had plenty of good food to eat. I mean, it was literally paradise on earth. Who would want to rebel against a deal like that? Yet Adam chose to disobey God. And by the way, have you ever wondered why Adam, why not Eve? Scripture always talks about Adam's sin, not Eve's sin. Well, Eve, I think, reacted on the, reacted on the impulse of the moment. 
But Adam was watching her. Adam had time to think about it. Adam could have stopped her. Adam could have refused to eat of the fruit. But his was a deliberate choice. And that's why the Bible speaks of Adam's sin rather than Eve's sin. And Genesis 3 gives us a glimpse of what God must have felt. Surprise at the disobedience. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Now understand, God knew all these things beforehand, yet in a way that we don't understand, he expressed himself in terms that we can understand. Not only was there surprise, he experienced sadness over a broken relationship. Verse 13 of Genesis 3, Then the Lord God, God said to him, What is this you have done? And can you just hear the pain? Can you hear almost the despair in his voice? And then there was anger at their denials and excuses. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing with, and with pain you will give birth to children. And to Adam he said, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat it of it all the day of your life. That's why he had to discipline them, just like any good parent would. But he must have felt especially grieved, since Adam's sin tainted all his descendants. Romans 5 tells us that, therefore just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all. It immediately affected Adam's children. God must have despaired when Cain murdered his brother. The Lord said to him, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And God offered Cain forgiveness, yet Cain chose to go his own way. But such was God's love, despite Cain's punishment, that God still protected him from the vengeance of others. And as man's depravity increased, so did God's pain. He was utterly broken-hearted. Genesis 5, 6, 5 and 6, we read, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. Not much different from a parent who hears a rebellious teenager say, I hate you. Or I never want to see you again in my entire life. And such parents must have wondered how such a rebellious child could have brought them so much joy as a baby. Well, God didn't only have one rebellious child. The entire world had rejected him. And so, he decided to call the whole deal off. In Genesis 6 verse 7, So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, for I am grieved that I have made them. God decided to drown his sorrows. The experiment with man had failed. And he planned to destroy everything that brought him so much joy in Genesis 1. Now again, I want to point out, God wasn't caught off guard because according to Revelation 13, verse 8, his plan to redeem mankind was in place before the creation of the world. But this text is just another example of God revealing his feelings. It's over. But there was one exception. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And we can almost sense God's relief at last. Someone to build on. In Ezekiel 14.20, Noah is listed as one of God's three most righteous followers together with... Does anybody else know? Who the other two are mentioned? Job and Daniel. Go and look it up. Ezekiel 14.20. And as a result, God not only spared Noah, but promised never to destroy the earth again. Yet, most of Noah's descendants continued to rebel against the Lord. For example, just two chapters later, we read about the Tower of Babel, where man just rebelled against God. 
And so it seems that God now came up with a new plan. Rather than restore the whole world, God now to start, decides to start with one man. And the plan was to make Abraham the father of a chosen nation. And he said to Abraham in Genesis 12, 2, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And God was, it would seem the plan was that if not the whole world, then at least there would be a nation who would worship me, who would love me. And he started with Abram. Yet, even Abram didn't trust God at first. I mean, he flees to Egypt at the first famine, even though God had promised to make a great nation of him in this particular land. He lies about his wife, and he allows Pharaoh to marry Sarah. And some years later, he did it again. He was into his own hands because God had promised him a son through Sarah, but he went and slept with Hagar. However, God persevered with Abram. And eventually, Abram learned to trust God. And I doubt if there's an example of greater faith than that of Abram when he was prepared to sacrifice Isaac. And Hebrews 11:19 says, Abram reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. And so, Abram's family grew into a major nation of about two million people by the time they left Egypt. And they became known as the people of Israel. And you know that Israel was the name of Abraham's grandson. And so now we have the people of Israel. And God revealed his great power to Israel when he delivered them from Egypt. Acts 13, 17 says that God of the people of Israel chose our fathers. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of the country just to show them what he had in store for them, if they would only trust him. But he kept testing them to prove their love for him. Deuteronomy 13.3 says, The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. He tested them when they faced the Red Sea. He tested them when there was lack of water, when there was lack of food, and so on. And every time he provided miraculously. And I think one of the reasons why the Lord allows us to go through trials is to let us see whether we really love him. He knows our hearts. It's for us to know it. Some years ago, it's going about back 12 years ago, one of our grandchildren we visited from America. He was four years old. And we heard a splash in the pool and we looked over and he was floating face down. And his dad was nearby, rushed in, jumped him pulled him out of the pool, and, and Blaze, that was the grandson's name, Blaze was fine, and he's fine today. And of course, we praise the Lord for that, but the question was, if he had drowned, would we still have praised the Lord? I mean, that's the real test of faith. And it's easy to praise God when things go wrong. So God kept testing them, and they rejected him time and time again. Psalm 106 verse 7 says, When our fathers were in Egypt, they gave no thought to your miracles. They did not remember your many kindnesses. And they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. I mean, how deprived can man be? And Jeremiah 79 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. And you know, God had such a longing for his covenant to succeed. In Deuteronomy 5.29, the Lord says, Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commands always, so that it might go well with them and their children forever. Isn't it absolutely astounding that God would make himself so vulnerable to say things like that? Because he wanted a people exclusively for himself. In Exodus 6, 7, he says, I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. And that speaks of this intimate, personal relationship. That's why he delivered them from Egypt. And they were to be very precious to him. In Exodus 19, verse 5, the Lord says, Out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Is not this the language of a lover? And he longed, for their single-hearted devotion. Exodus 34, 14. 
Do not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Now for us, the word jealousy is, you know, has a negative connotation. But it wasn't jealous in that sense. The best translation of that word would be zealous. Because he is passionate about us. And it's no different from any other love relationship. We just want that exclusive relationship with our loved one. And he did everything he could to woo Israel. In Ezekiel 16 we read, no one, this is the Lord speaking, and he's speaking to Israel, and he's saying, no one looked on you with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field. From the day you were born, you were despised. Then I passed by and saw you kicking about in your blood, and as you lay there in your blood, I said to you, live. I made you grow like a plant of the field. You grew up and developed and became the most beautiful of jewels. That's how God looked upon his people. He regarded her as his bride, a few verses later tells us. But Israel was an unfaithful wife. She became a prostitute. And, and the, you, know, you can read that in Ezekiel 16. It's that same chapter. She rejected the Lord in favor of idols. Almighty God experienced the pain of a rejected spouse. Ezekiel 6 verse 9, he says, They will realize how I was crushed by their unfaithful heart. Listen, this is Almighty God speaking, opening up his heart. I was crushed because of what my people did. Isn't that amazing? He didn't reject her. He did not reject her. I would have. But he went on to say, I will establish my covenant with you, and you will know that I am the Lord. And so it would seem now that the people of Israel as a nation were not going to worship God. So now God takes a different approach. And he focuses on the kings of Israel. Perhaps they could lead the people to worship God. Saul, however, rejected God's word. I mean, he started off well, but with time he deliberately disobeyed the Lord's instructions. But David, ah, oh, David became a man after God's own heart. Even though he was an adulterer and a murderer. I mean, David messed up in a number of areas. Number, for example, he allowed the assassination of Abner to go unpunished. He also failed as a, as a father. He didn't discipline his children. Why then would he be called a man after God's own heart? And I think it's because David loved the Lord and obeyed his word. In Psalm 18, 1, he says, David, the servant of the Lord, said, I love you, O Lord, my strength. And in Psalm 119, 11, he says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And that was David's lifestyle most of the times. And he was a man after God's heart because when he did sin, there was genuine repentance. And the Lord was no doubt hoping that Solomon would follow suit. It seems like his plan to reach his people through the kings was working. And so he gave Solomon everything a man could ever want. Wisdom and honor and power and wealth. The only thing he did not give Solomon, but Solomon took for himself, was 1,000 wives. Can you believe that? And they said he was a wise man. I understand that his last wife said to him, Solly, do you really love me? And he said, my dear, you are one in a thousand. <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> but despite all the things that the Lord gave Solomon, he turned away from the Lord. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart to other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord, his God. Can you hear God's anguished cry? Why? What more could I have done for you? And a few years after Solomon's death, the kingdom of Israel was split in two. What had happened to this nation that God tried to set aside for himself? And you know, after the split, 
Most kings, and there were a few exceptions, rejected the Lord. Solomon's son, Rehoboam, abandoned the Lord. We read that in Second Chronicles 12. And as time progressed, the Lord had less and less direct dealings with the kings of Israel and Judah. It's as if his plan to work through the head of the nations had also failed. Now again, I remind you, God is all-powerful, but he limits himself because of the free choice he has given to us. And so now the Lord turns to the prophets to call his people to himself. And he revealed to them some of his deepest feelings. Did you know that the Lord hurts when his people hurt? In Isaiah 63, 9, in all their distress, he too was distressed. And again, he's exposing his own vulnerability. Just like parents hurt when they have to apply tough love to their children. Isn't that amazing that when you and I are hurting, he also hurts because he genuinely cares for us? And of course, people say, well, if he genuinely cares for us, why does he not prevent the pain? Well, that is a whole topic on itself, but let me give you one thought. If Christians did not experience trials, people would want to become Christians for all the wrong reasons. But God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, says Ezekiel 18. And so often people say, how can a God of love send people to hell? God sends nobody to hell. All he does is say, this is where you are heading, but I have made a way of escape. And if people choose not to make use of that way of escape through Jesus Christ, God can only weep. And time and again, God expresses his willingness to forgive if only they would turn to him. In Ezekiel 20, where the rebellions of Israel are listed, it says time and again that the Lord withheld punishment and he had pity on his people. He longs to be gracious to his people, despite their rebellion. In Isaiah 38, 30 verse 18, yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. In fact, one of his prophets, Hosea, had to marry a prostitute as an object lesson. Gomer was unfaithful to Hosea time and again. He even had to buy her back at the slave market as an illustration of God, what God was willing to do for his people. And the Lord's emotions continually vacillated from anger to compassion. In Hosea 11 verse 7 we read, My people are determined to turn from me. Even if they call to the Most High, he will by no means exalt him. And here in verse 7 of Isaiah 11, God says, I've had it with you, I'm through with you, I'm finished with you. Listen to what he then says in verse 8. How can I give you up, Ephraim? Which is another word for Israel. How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. Doesn't this make God real? On the one hand, angry, yes. And the next minute, no. My compassion. And by the way, Adma and Zebim, if you wonder what those towns, they were the towns that were part of the Sodom and Gomorrah complex and were destroyed at the same time as Sodom and Gomorrah. And it seems to me that the Lord is expressing the same emotions as those of a jilted lover. Anger, grief, forgiveness, jealousy, love, pain? Is this almighty God? And eventually he resorts to discipline. And in Jeremiah 9 verse 7, therefore this is what the Lord Almighty says, see I will refine and test them for what else can I do because of the sin of my people. And he sent them into exile to Babylon for 70 years. And for the next 400 years, God is silent. From that time on, the country of Israel was ruled by foreigners. For example, like the Romans at the time of Jesus. Even King Herod was not a Jew, he was an Edomite. Now God is beyond the realm of time and it's very difficult for us to understand how he thinks and how he feels since he knew everything beforehand. But I think it's described to us in a time frame that we can understand God is not weak or helpless. 
And yet the almighty creator has limited himself because that is what love requires. For example, in 1 Timothy 2.4, we read that he wants all men to be saved. But his will is not being done because he won't force himself on anyone. God is silent. So now he makes one last final attempt. God's messengers had been rejected and killed time and again. So now he sends his only son. And this is revealed to us in a parable that Jesus taught in Matthew 21 from 33 onwards. Listen to another parable. This is Jesus speaking. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time. So now there's a whole lot of guys coming. And the tenants treated them the same way. And last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son. Listen to God's hope expressed that they would accept his son. Perhaps it was, you know, they'd reject him in the past because the people of Israel couldn't love God because he was too awesome, too remote. Do you remember in Exodus 20, 19, the people said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. After all, no one had ever seen him face to face and lived. Even Moses was only allowed to see the back of God. And of course, it's hard to love someone whom you don't really know. A true love relationship can only flourish between two equals. Soren Kierkegaard, that Danish philosopher, said, Love makes the unequal equal. It's like a prince who falls in love with a peasant maiden. He cannot just go up to her and say, will you marry me? Because she might say yes for the wrong reasons. She might say yes because how can she say no to the prince? Or maybe she says yes because she would like the pomp and status that will go with it. I mean, how will he ever know if she really loves him? So what does the prince do? He disguises himself as a peasant and he woos her on an equal basis. And that's what God decided to do. He decides to become a man, to become equal to the object of his love. And he gave up his glory and splendor in order to woo us on an equal basis. That's why we read in Philippians 2, 6 and 7, Jesus, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Man could now see God, touch God, argue with God. John writes his, starts his first epistle like this. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. And he's referring here to Jesus as the word of life. What condescension. And the word condescension simply means to lower oneself in order to be with. What risk. Man could now defame God. Abuse God, humiliate God, mock God, kill God. And that's exactly what man did. Going back to the parable. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. And you begin to wonder, what lengths will God go to to win our love? And again we see God weeping broken heartedly. In Luke 13, 34, Jesus said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings? But you were not willing. 
That must be some of the most haunting words in Scripture. You were not willing. Was it worth the pain? Was it worth the heartache? Yes. Because he did find a bride to dwell with him in his new home. And Revelation 19 verse 7 says that all believers are going to be the bride of Christ. But we have a problem. The status of the bride. And that brings us to the other reason why Jesus had to come to earth. I mean, what would happen, back to our story, what would happen if the peasant maiden falls in love with what she thinks is a peasant man and then later discovers he's the prince? What now? I mean, royalty cannot marry a commoner. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, What do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? It's not possible. And so the bride had to be given equal status. Just like Diana Spencer and Kate Middleton were both given royal status when they married Prince uh, Charles and, and Prince William. Because love makes the unequal equal. And Christ's bride had to be as holy as and as perfect as himself, because Revelation 21, 27 says nothing impure will ever enter the new Jerusalem. Sin can never come into his presence. And to be made holy could only be accomplished by sacrificing himself for her. Hebrews 10, 10 says we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Four verses later it says, we've been made perfect forever by his sacrifice. And through faith in him, we have been made holy like the rest of the family. Hebrews 2.11 says, both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. In eternity, we will be like Jesus. 1 John 3, 2, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. And God will make every believer like himself so that we can relate to him on an equal basis when we live with him in glory. For an unbeliever, it would be hell to go to heaven, to have to live with somebody that you don't care about. Well, how do we return God's love? First of all, by getting to know him. In 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that fellowship speaks of a friendship. And you cannot love somebody if you don't really know them. That's why in Revelation 3, verse 20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door and invites me in, I will come in and eat with him, have a meal with him, and you only have meals with friends. And the key to getting to know him is our daily quiet time, not just a quick verse in the morning, not listening to some devotions that Arnold Moll sends out. That's, I hope you don't do that only. I hope you listen, but not only. No, you need to get into the word yourself. And of course, he reveals himself through his word. In on Samuel, we read, he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. It's the only way to know God. Joy and I got engaged, and three weeks later, I left for South America and spent 10 months there. No internet, no emails. I mean, this was 52 years ago. But we wrote letters, long, long letters. And believe me, I read them over and over and over again. Because that's the only way I would get to know her. David said in Psalm 119, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Secondly, we return God's love by obeying him. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. And the more we obey him, the stronger our feelings of love for him will develop. It's no different in a marriage. The more I do things for my wife, the more I love her. And you find that poor marriages are people where husband and wife do very little for each other. And of course, love is evidenced by service. Do you remember when Jesus met up with Peter after the resurrection? 
The third time he said to Peter, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now for Peter, it was to feed the believers. For us, it is to use our spiritual gifts. But it's natural to want to serve the one that we love. And thirdly, we return our love by loving others. As he has given us this command, and he has given us this command, whoever loves God must love his brother. And we love him when we meet the needs of others. Isn't it interesting that in Matthew 25, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And he was talking there about feeding them and caring for them and visiting them the sick. I often give to beggars. I don't know what to do with that money. Frankly, I don't care. Because I'm not giving it to the beggar. I'm giving it to the Lord. And if the above things are not done from a motive of love for Jesus, they are meaningless. 1 Corinthians 13 says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. The Lord, in the first place, does not want our service. He wants our love. Let me conclude. He gave up everything to win my love, to the point of being executed. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. How can I spurn such love? I can only respond by loving him with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my mind. Shall we just bow our heads in prayer? Father God, Abba, we will never ever understand the depths of your love that you have for, my, for your people. Lord, we can only respond by loving you, worshipping you, and serving you. Amen.